Hello and welcome to this tutorial on Magnetic Resonance Imaging, or MRI. I'm Dr. Rasmus Byrne from the University of Wisconsin at Madison. In this tutorial, I will be describing the basics of how MRI works. MRI is an incredibly useful imaging technique, allowing us to see the details of various parts of the body. It is particularly good at showing us details about the soft tissues within the body, such as the muscles and ligaments, the spinal cord and discs in the neck, and the brain. So how does an MRI create pictures like this? Here is a picture of an MRI scanner. An MRI scanner consists primarily of a very large magnet. We put a person into this magnet and then send radio waves into the body. An MRI scan does not use any x-rays or other ionizing radiation. Here is a brief one-slide overview of MRI. When a person is placed into the magnet, the nuclei of certain atoms, particularly hydrogen atoms bound in the form of water, like to align themselves with the magnetic field. We then send a radio wave into the body. The body briefly absorbs this radio wave and then re-emits it a short time later. This radio wave tells us about the number of protons, that is the amount of water, in different parts of the body. And, importantly, it tells us about the magnetic environment that that water is in. This magnetic environment is determined by the tissue structure. This, in a nutshell, is how MRI works. Now, let us look at these steps in greater detail. There are three basic components to MRI, which can be understood by the three words magnetic, resonance, and imaging. First, we place the person to be scanned into a large magnet. This magnet consists of coils of wire as shown in this schematic of an electromagnet. The magnets used for medical imaging typically have a strength of about one and a half to three tesla. This is about 300 times as strong as a typical bar magnet. It consists of about 200 kilometers of wire and weighs about 10 tons. The wire used at MRI is superconducting, meaning the wire has no resistance as long as it is kept very cold. MRIs are therefore cooled with liquid helium at about minus 270 degrees Celsius. In addition, because the wires are superconducting, the current flows through these wires even without applying any external power. As a result, the MRI magnet is always on. Certain atoms, such as hydrogen, have a property called nuclear spin. In the absence of a magnetic field, these spins point in random directions, as illustrated here. However, in the presence of a magnetic field, these spins either align or anti-align themselves with the magnetic field. One atom in particular, whose nucleus likes to align itself with the magnetic field, is hydrogen, and especially hydrogen bound in the form of water. These spins process, or spin, around the magnetic field with a specific frequency, omega, that is directly proportional to the strength of the magnetic field that they experience. Slightly more spins align themselves with the magnetic field instead of anti-aligning themselves. This results in a net magnetization. Now, this magnetization is extremely small. Fortunately, water is one of the most abundant molecules in the human body. However, the magnetization is still too small to detect directly. The way we detect this small magnetization is by using radio waves and a phenomenon called resonance. A radio wave is sent into the part of the body we want to image using a radio frequency or RF coil. These coils can have a variety of shapes and sizes. When a radio wave of a specific frequency is sent into the body, the magnetization is tipped away from being aligned with the main magnetic field. The frequency of the radio wave necessary to tip the magnetization is the same as the precession frequency of the spins. This is why we call it magnetic resonance imaging. The radio wave is then turned off and the magnetization processes or rotates around the direction of the main magnetic field. This rotating magnetization can induce a current in a coil of wire or antenna. In other words, the processing magnetization generates a radio wave which we can detect using a radio frequency coil. This receive radio frequency coil can be either the same coil that we used for sending in the radio wave or a different one. The amplitude of this radio wave tells us about the amount of magnetization 
and thus the amount of hydrogen protons or water in the body part we are imaging. The third step in MRI, the imaging, is to determine how much magnetization, that is, how much water, there is in different areas of the body part we are imaging. In other words, we want to create an image of this magnetization. The trick to doing this is to apply magnetic field gradients. As you recall, the spins process and thus create a radio frequency wave with a frequency directly proportional to the strength of the magnetic field experienced by the spins. By making the field a bit stronger on one side of the image, in this case the brain, and weaker on the other side, the spins process at a different frequency on one side compared to the other. By looking at the frequency of the radio wave, we can then find out where the signal is coming from. The acquisition is then repeated with different gradients in different directions to build a full 2D or 3D image. It is largely this trick of using magnetic field gradients to create an image that got Paul Otterberg and Peter Mansfield the Nobel Prize. In addition, the magnetic field gradients are why MRIs are so loud. The switching gradients back and forth in the presence of a strong magnetic field creates vibrations in the gradient coil, resulting in sound waves. One of the benefits of MRI is the amazing contrast between different tissue types and the ability to adjust that contrast by changing the way the data are acquired. For example, the images here show two different brain slices acquired with two different contrasts, one of which we call T1 weighted and the other T2 weighted. Let us briefly explore what is meant by T1 and T2. As I mentioned earlier, after sending in a radio wave, the magnetization is tipped into the transverse plane where it is processes or rotates about the magnetic field. As it is rotating around, the spins also realign themselves with the main magnetic field and thus the net magnetization becomes realigned with the main magnetic field. The time constant at which this realignment or relaxation takes place is called the longitudinal relaxation time or T1. Different tissues have different relaxation times. Now, in order to encode all of the spatial information in the image, we have to repeat this process many times, exciting the spins by sending in an RF pulse, allowing them to relax for a brief period, and then exciting them again. If we wait only a short while before exciting the spins again, they will not have recovered their complete longitudinal magnetization, as shown here and therefore there will be less signal for the next excitation. As a result, we will see more signal from spins that have recovered faster. In other words, tissues with a shorter T1 will appear brighter. And that is exactly what is shown here. The T1, or longitudinal relaxation time, of white matter is shorter than that of gray matter, or cerebrospinal fluid, or CSF, and thus it appears bright in the images. In contrast, CSF has a long T1, and thus areas with a lot of CSF appear dark in the image. Another important contrast in MRI is T2 contrast. Again, after sending in a radio wave, the magnetization is tipped into the transverse plane, and it processes, or rotates, around the direction of the main magnetic field. The frequency of this procession is directly proportional to the strength of the magnetic field, However, the structure of the tissue being imaged and the presence of other spins causes each spin to experience a slightly different magnetic field. Therefore, the spins don't all process at exactly the same frequency as illustrated here with the magnetizations fanning out. The net sum of this magnetization is therefore smaller and decreases as the spins fan out or dephase. The time constant at which the signal decreases is called T2, or the transverse relaxation time. Different tissues have different rates of this signal decrease. Therefore, if we acquire an image at a specific time, after sending in a radio wave, areas with a shorter T2 will have less signal. That is exactly what is seen here in this T2-weighted brain image. Brain areas with a short T2, such as white matter, 
appear dark in the image, while areas with a long T2, such as CSF, appear bright. So in summary, an MRI image is formed by three basic steps. First, we put the person in a strong magnet. This aligns the nuclei of certain atoms, particularly hydrogen bound in the form of water, with the magnetic field. We then send in a radio wave. This perturbs the alignment of the spins, and as the spins realign themselves with the magnetic field, they send off a radio wave. Third, we apply magnetic field gradients to encode the spatial position into the frequency of that radio wave. This allows us to determine where the spins are located. The signal we measure then tells us about the amount of water in different parts of the image, in this case the brain, and importantly, the magnetic environment that that water is in. These differences in the magnetic environment, which is determined by the tissue structure, and also such factors as blood flow and oxygenation, is what gives us the ability to see such striking details and contrast, as well as the ability to see blood flow and oxygenation changes related to variations in brain activity. It is what makes MRI the powerful technique that it is today. Thank you.